so little of life is comprised of huge, dramatic, running out into the rain to cry Stella. If we saved our short fiction for only those moments, not only am I not totally sure what we would write about, but I'm not sure it would be all that accurate a portrayal of what it is to be a person. Welcome to the Story A Day podcast. This is Julie Duffy from storyaday.org, encouraging you to be a writer every day, not someday. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Julie here from the Story A Day podcast. I have a treat for you this week. I have an interview with Gwen E. Kirby, who is the author of the debut collection, Shit Cassandra Saw. Now, this podcast is normally curse word free. This week it will be a little less curse word free, partly because of the title of the story and partly because it's two adults having a conversation. If you have any littles around, you might want to listen to this later or just educate them in the way of the world right now. Gwen E. Kirby, as well as being the author of the this fabulous debut collection of short stories, has a MFA from Johns Hopkins University, a PhD from the University of Cincinnati, and is the Associate Director of programs and finance for the Sewanee Writers Conference at the University of the South, where she's also teaching students about creative writing, lucky students. Her writing has appeared in One Story, Tin House, Guernica, Smoke Long Quarterly, and uh, many other places. In this conversation, we talk about her new collection. We talk about some of the stories in the collection. We talk about the benefit of a, a fantastic title. We talk about how to take an idea and develop it into a story. And then in the second part of this interview, which is in the next episode, we will talk more about developing characters that feel real to people. We'll talk about writing at this moment in time, writing about women, and the question that Gwen Kirby doesn't get asked often enough, and she gets to answer that. So I hope you enjoy this conversation divided into these two episodes. It should inspire you, give you some some ways to approach your writing, and some courage, I hope, to get some writing done. And that's partly why I split it into two episodes so that you can get inspired, go away, do some writing, come back, listen to the next part, get inspired, go away, do some writing. I'm going to be having more guests like this on the podcast this year, so I hope that's going to be fun for all of us. All right, settle back and get ready for my conversation with Gwen E. Kirby. Thank you for being here. I'm thrilled to be here. So for people who are coming to your work for the first time, I'm going to hold up the book here. This is your um, collection of short stories, um, Shit Cassandra Saul, um, named for the title story, which is... Shit, Cassandra saw that she didn't tell the Trojans because at that point, but them anyway. Which I think sort of tells people a little bit about what they need to know about the stories in the book. Tell me about that. Yes, I, I feel very good about it. I, I have had people ask, you know, like, oh gosh, you know, aren't you worried that the title of the book, Shit, Cassandra saw that that's going to be, you know, off-putting to readers. Um, and I just think, if you're put off by that, you're you're probably not going to like what's inside the book. I mean, it is, I think it's a. I hope that the stories are are pretty frank. Um, that they they don't shy away from from swearing or or sex or any of the things that that the characters might be going through. And I I, I wanted to I wanted to open the collection with a bang, um, which is part of why I chose the Cassandra story. But also, I just felt like it. It set the book up thematically, kind of from where I wanted it to, to go, which is basically that, you know, women speaking up, speaking their truths, um, you know, obviously is as old as Cassandra, is as old as time. Um, and the question is just sort of who is listening, right? And 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 who is being believed in any given narrative. So I think it's a I think it's a good place to start. And also I just that title is probably my favorite title I've ever written. It uh, makes me really happy. I'm a huge fan of titles that like are a little bit cheeky and maybe go on a little bit too long. And I think that's a great way, especially when you're working with short stories. I absolutely love long titles. So yeah, yeah. me too. And especially for flash fiction, you know, when you're going to write something that's only 900 words long, the title needs to do the heavy listing. And so because I have the title, I can start a story that's just like, 
Jello, moonbeams, you know, and you know exactly what it is without needing any more explanation than the title itself. That's great, actually. That, I'm glad you brought that up because people often ask, you know, how how long can the title be, or if it's flash fiction, you know, does the title count? So, could you talk a little bit more about what you mean when you say the title does the heavy lifting in the short story that short? Oh yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, as I'm sure your listeners know, but you know, flash fiction is kind of an arbitrary category, but it's stories that are fewer than a thousand words. The title doesn't count in your word count. Uh, and, you know, I think in general, in short fiction, a title can do an enormous amount of work to do things like set the tone, which that title certainly does, um, and to kind of explain the premise of the story, right? So it says, you know, shit Cassandra saw that she didn't tell the Trojans because at that point, fuck them anyway. And that basically sets up what it's going to be, which is a list story. This is Cassandra listing the things that we know in some way you know, either give her joy or touch her or interest her. These are the things that, you know, that she's kind of keeping for herself. Um, and throughout the book, I mean, if you look at the table of contents for my collection, it's quite a, it's quite something. Um, and I use titles constantly as, as cheats. So like all of the historical stories, um, you know, often will have the name of the historical figure, where they are, and the year it takes place, all in the title. Because, it's almost like know, a dateline as well. Like you're reading a newspaper article, you know, Mary Reed is a cross-dressing pirate. The raging seas, 1720. Well, yeah, exactly. And, you know, those are those are a really great cheat because, you know, particularly when you're writing historical fiction, it's not like Mary Reed is sitting there thinking like, mm -hmm, well, I'm having a really great time in the year 17, whatever, in the same way that I don't sit around thinking like, what a 2022, what an exciting time to be alive. You know, and so by having that in the title, my character doesn't need to do any weird dating that would feel really unnatural coming from her. And I mean, there are other stories like that in the collection too. There's one um, Midwestern girl is tired of appearing in your short stories, which is just, that is the premise of the story. And because it's in the title, I just, I just take off from there. I feel like titles are often really underutilized. I, I always tell my students, you know, if you're just titling your story, like, hope. Yes. You know, you're you're missing an opportunity to to hook the reader and to to do some work for you. I think that's one of the things that short story writers have a huge advantage over people who are writing novels. Not to say that those are always different people, but you know, when you're writing a novel, it has to fit on the cover. It has to show up in that little tiny little, you know, image on Amazon. And short story writers get to write, you know. 15, 20 words if we want to. <laughs> Let's not waste that opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. So that, it's interesting that you say that the title for the historical ones are giving you an opportunity to really set the context because the, this collection, there are a number of um, historical stories, but there are also some that are bang up to date. And you are able to indicate that in the context of the story really, really quickly. So um, you, how how do you think about that? Like if you're writing a story, for example, um, you have Mount Adams at Mar Vista, which is about some girls at a, a sports event after their schools had a school shooting and they're all dealing with the internal stuff that comes up for that. So in a story like that, you've gone, you know, we've had a couple of, of other, you know, a historical story right before it. So how, how do you go about setting the stage when it's not in the title? Well, I guess I'll go like two ways from that collection, or from that question. One, I think that, I, I hope that the reader doesn't feel particularly jarred in the story, moving between the historical stories and the contemporary stories, because I, I think in all of them, I want the voice to sound contemporary. I think that there's a risk when you write historical that we make them sound, I don't know, old, you know, like no one in the past was sitting around being like, oh yes, and this is the way I'm speaking and it's so stilted because I'm in history, right? The way that they were speaking for them felt as contemporary as the way that I'm speaking right now. Yeah. And so I want the voices in the collection to feel like even as we jump in time, they're sort of like, immediacy and contemporariness is closely established. Um, you know, as for kind of how you set the scene in a story when the title's not doing the heavy lifting, I, I think the first paragraph of a story it does a tremendous amount of work. Um, and and I hope in the Mount Adams and Mar Vista story, it 
kind of the stakes of it are are clear right away. That was a that was a story that was hard for me to write because it was based on it was based on something that happened to me. My softball team played another team that had had a school shooting, and it was a very bizarre and surreal experience. Um, and I and I wanted to capture that sort of that melding of the the horrific and tragic and the mundane because I think that that is how that is how horror for the most part, enters our lives, um, particularly with the internet. I mean, you just, you read about these horrible things and then you take a sip of your coffee and then you send an email. And I, I wanted the story to kind of capture that question of like, how do we, I don't know, how do we just live our normal boring lives? How do we try to play the softball game while also sort of in the face of, of tragedy? Yeah. And you get inside the girls' heads so clearly. And it's, I think it's that mix of the the horror and the mundane that really, you, I, I would say you, you achieved your goal there because that, that really <laughs> captured me. Um, and, and with the historical stories too, the, the voice of the character, like you say, I was trying to figure out how to explain or, or frame a question around that, but you've, I think you said it when like they sound contemporary to themselves. So it's not like you haven't got anachronisms in there they're not checking their iphones or well actually some of them are you know <laughs> they, might be knowing me. <laughs> they might be but you know the but, <laughs> but it doesn't jar right it's it's all very it's all very smooth so there's a thing that these are i gotta say i don't often read all of the stories in a short story collection that's fair it's enough session time <laughs> and i certainly don't always enjoy them I really did. And I'm not just saying that because you're here. I actually, this was a, a joy to read because I, I did enjoy all the stories. And, and you've got, you know, like a review of a crab shack. You've got Cassandra ranting about stuff she doesn't like. And you've got, you know, m stories where women are, are breaking out and, and doing things that are not necessarily realistic, but mm. we that we wish we could do. So can you talk me through the process a little bit, first of all, of taking an idea like that all of these have obviously come from different nuggets of ideas and how how do you go about developing those into stories i mean every story is so different um and i feel like for me the fact that the collection does sort of seem to be as eclectic as it is you know like a yelp review of a crab shack and then it's a story about women turning into radioactive cockroaches and then it's a woman being accused of witchcraft in Wales in the 1500s or whatever. Um, I think they feel eclectic together, but they also just feel like the inside of my brain. Like these are just, these are just the things that for whatever reason on that day were on my mind and I was thinking about and trying to write about. And I think for me, the, the question always is specifically with the stories that have kind of weird or strange premises is, you know, does this still have, like, is there still a heart to this story? Like, you know, like, why am I telling this story? And, and I think the answer can never just be like, to look clever or to like show what kind of trick I can do, you know, with form or whatever. Because I, as a reader, that never, that has never particularly interested me, you know? So for instance, like with the Yelp review of the, the Crab Shack, um, that story is called Jerry's Crab Shack, One Star. And it's about this man who, he tries to take his wife to dinner um, and he really like, he really wants it to go well and it's just a disaster. And so the way that he copes with it is, is he tries to write this, this Yelp review that he says is going to be fair and balanced. And for me, the heart of that story is that this man just cares deeply about trying to write this Yelp review. He wants to make something right. And so the form isn't about being clever. It's, it's about this man genuinely trying to invest in like one final way to make sense of the evening. Um, and so, yeah, whenever I approach a story, I think my first thought is always, you know, who is this person and why does this really matter? Why does this really matter to them? No matter how absurd or serious the premise is, um, I think that question is always at the heart of it. Yeah, because the, the, the characters all, each story, it, it really does seem rooted in the character. It doesn't ever, although they are a little unusual, some of the forms that, that they're written in, um, it never, yeah, it doesn't feel like you're just doing it for the sake of it, that you're just showing off, you know, it feels like. I, I hope not. Yeah, I mean, I don't know, showing off, I feel like I would have to be, I don't know, a better writer and have anything to show off, but yeah, I just, I, I've never understood stories where it's just like the point is to just be like, look what I can do, or like, look how I can make fun of this character. Like, I would never want to make up a character just to, 
gives them a good kicking. That doesn't that doesn't really seem like that's the role of the of the writer uh, when we're doing our best job. There's one story in this collection which sort of will tickle the. I think tickle most of the writers in the audience, and that's the one you were talking about. Midwestern girl, is is it tired of being in it's your tired short of appearing in your short stories? Your short stories, and and like that was one that really tickled me because it it is is this Midwestern this character who turns up in in you know fiction written by that guy in your MFA program, um, for example, and yes. you take her and you. Um, allow her to to live and breathe. That story was really fun to write. And I, I was just really glad people liked it. Because I think that is kind of, as you say, like that definitely feels like the story in the collection that's like the writer story. Like I'm writing that for other writers and readers, I guess, and readers to to laugh at. Um, because we've read that character so many times. And in many ways, we've seen that character so many times. Like there's, because, you know, California girl shows up in that story and Portland girl and the Manny, Manic Pixie Dream Girl. I mean, I think we're familiar with those with those tropes. But it's not just an angry rant. You're, it's, it is a bit of a no. retail for, for other writers, but it, you also, you take that idea and it's not just like, you shouldn't do this in your stories. You actually take her and give her her own story. Yeah. And I, and I hope people notice, cause it was important to me too, that the, that the guy who's writing her um, becomes more complicated as the story goes on. I mean, he's clearly trying to work through some stuff about his own father um, you know, he, he doesn't really know how to make a story that's the story that he wants to tell. And I think any writer who's being honest will admit that, especially when their early days learning how to write, we all people are stories with Midwestern girls. You know, like we're all using the tropes and the cliches and the, the found things that, you know, that we've seen in culture a million times over. And you don't start pulling those things out of your writing until you're I think quite a bit more sort of self-aware and and self-controlled as an author. So I I felt a lot of sympathy for the dude writing her too. You know, like he's really trying to I don't know he's kind of trying to make it work and and realizing as the story goes on that he's been fucking it up. <laughs> and he does yeah he does become more sympathetic as even you know not it's it's a there's a really interesting blend in this all of these stories between humor and anger. And all the things that, that we do in life, right? There's sex and there's outrage and there's happiness and friendship and kind of crappy friendship. And mm. like, you've taken a lot of things that when I'm talking to writers, I get a lot of questions, a lot of insecurity comes out about writing, about things that aren't important, like not big, dramatic, life-changing um, you know, I want to write something, but who am I to write this? Or, you know, I, I haven't lived an interesting enough life, stuff like that. You've written a lot of stories about things here that that might seem like everyday occurrences. How do you give yourself permission to do that? Well, first and foremost, I have all those usual writer insecurities. Um, I feel like no writer is unique in their anxiety. I too worry that I don't have anything important to say, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I think then when you do take a step back from that, so little of life is comprised of like huge, dramatic, running out into the rain to cry Stella at the, you know, like, and if we saved our short fiction for only those moments, not only am I not totally sure what we would write about, but I'm not sure it would be all that accurate a portrayal of what it is to be a person. Um, and, and so I think in these smaller moments, you know, they're not uber dramatic in that falling, yelling in the rain way, but they are really important to the characters, you know, like, and then that feels very true to me. I mean, I, there are things happening in my life that feel really important or really fraught or, you know, et cetera. And, you know, they wouldn't, they probably wouldn't be like at the end of an Avengers movie, but they, they matter a lot to me. And so I, I try to remember that when I'm writing, that, that I think that is actually perhaps the closest we can get to exploring the human experience is to is to really delve into these moments that are that are significant but are perhaps not as flashy um yeah, and as yeah kind of universal too i mean there but you've got something particular to say about them but they i'm reading these stories and i can identify with what you know some of your historical characters are going through and what some of your modern characters are going through and we've got nothing else in common apart from the fact that we're human <laughs> yes which is to say we have everything in common all at the same time 
I hope you enjoyed that first part of my conversation with Gwen E. Kirby. You can find her book Shit Cassandra Saw wherever you get your books. As you can tell, I really enjoyed it. Next episode, you will be able to hear us talk about writing about women, the question that Gwen Kirby doesn't get asked often enough, and generally come back for some more inspiration and go off and do some writing now. Come back and get some inspiration on in the next episode. And I hope you have a great writing week. Keep writing. Thanks for listening. Why not come over to the blog at storyaday.org and check out this week's writing prompts and articles. And in the meantime, have a great creative week. And of course, keep writing. <laughs>